it's time to take a look at loops and we're not going to use Greenfoot for that just yet. We're just going to go back to NetBeans and I just want to show you the basic syntax of a loop. So I'll just create an application here, call it loops. And in this one, I'm really going to just type some code here for you and then I'll explain a bit about it as I'm uh, demonstrating the run of the code and what it does. But uh, basically I'm just going to make myself a program that repeats hello world. Okay, so so far this is probably very similar to something that you've already done. But here's where the loop's about to come in. So maybe you can predict what this code's going to do. Um, I'm going to write one thing underneath the loop there, just so you can see how it finishes. And this is going to take in uh, a number from the user and then repeat a certain number of times. We wouldn't be able to do this program without a loop because you can't even copy and paste this. You know, if you wanted it five times, that means the program would always run five times. Whereas the one I've created here needs no copy and paste, and I can do it five times. Um, I can do it one time, or you know, even if I don't want it to run at all, it'll be able to manage that for me. So I'm going to close this for a second and show you how a loop works. It's very similar to a decision. In fact, it'll run if I do this, but it's not going to repeat its code. It only happens the one time, and that's the difference between, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the difference between a loop and a decision. When you do a loop the code just keeps getting executed as long as this condition is true. So in order for a loop to work properly we need three conditions, or rather three parts. We first need to initialize the state of my program so that when I enter the loop I can decide if, it's if I should execute the code. So here what I'm doing is keeping track of how many times I've said the message. And as long as I haven't gone over the number of times that have been asked for, I will execute this code. And now that I've printed it, I will update how many times the count of the message that's been printed. If I forget to do that, then what happens is it's true when it gets into the loop and then there's nothing to make it false. So I get what's called an infinite loop. And I'll show you what that looks like. If I say I only want it one time, uh, it's running and running and running forever. So really, um, I'll stop this. You have to have those three parts there in order for it to work the way you want it to. The condition in here is, is one that's easy. I mean, if you forget it, Java's just going to tell you. right? They won't let you do that. But these ones here are a little harder because you technically don't have to have this initial condition here. Um, and you, you don't have to write that in there either. And Java would still be OK to compile your code. However, you probably get some errors happening. So with that in mind, there's another kind of loop in Java other than a while loop. And it's called a for loop. So let me show you how it works. To do a for loop, it uses the same three parts. The loops are equivalent. So anything you can do with a while loop, you can do with a for loop. And a for loop lets you see all three pieces together at the same time. So it just basically gives you a way to organize the code so that you know you've done all three things and you didn't forget. You can still omit them, but if it, is been, if it has been omitted, you'll you know hopefully notice that you missed one of the pieces in here. So the way it works is exactly the same as a while loop would, and I'll run the program just to show you that it does the same thing. But this piece of code is executed one time to initialize the loop. Then this code is checked, and if it's true, it'll then go here and execute your code. From there, it's going to go up to here and update your, your condition. Then it will recheck the condition, go back to your code, update the condition, check the condition until eventually it's false and it lands here outside the loop. So if I run it, this for loop, uh, say I want it three times, it does three times exactly like it did when we had the while loop. 
So that's the basic syntax for a while loop and a for loop, and those are the only loops that we're going to work with in our course. However, there are other ways of doing this in Java, but those are the most convenient ones that we uh, will be able to do, and it won't hold us back in anything else we do in the program. So here's our world, the way it looks right now. And one of the problems I'm having with the world, or at least that I don't really like about the world, is that the fish come on randomly, and it's basically just an endurance exercise. You know, I just keep running my game until I get bored. Like, I don't know when to finish the level or, you know, what to do here with these random fish coming in. So what I'm going to do is make my goal a little bit better defined. Rather than have the fish just come at all random times, I'm going to put a fixed number in to populate the world at the beginning of the game. And then the level will be over once I've eaten all the fish. So I'm going to go into the ocean class, and I'm going to update some of this code. So this was for my random behavior of putting fish in the world. I'm going to remove that. And then I'm going to go down, just tidy up all the places where it had that re random behavior of adding fish. And instead what I'm going to do is when the world is created, and that's in here in the constructor, I'm going to populate the world with fish. So here I'll pick some kind of variable like um, fish count. I'll start it at zero. Sorry, count. And I'll have another one to keep track of how many I've put in. Now what I'm going to do is create a loop that says while the fish count is less than the number of fish, sorry, um, while the fish added is less than the count, I'll add the fish to the world. So here, um, why don't we say the game's going to have 10 fish that will be randomly populating the world. And when I add it in, I'll keep track that another fish has been added, so I'll put that here. So here's the conditions that make up my loop. Here I initialize it, no fish have been added, and as long as I haven't added more fish than the count, you can keep adding them. So this will be my code in here where I'm going to insert the fish to the world. But before I do that, one thing I, I'm going to take a look at here is I don't want the fish to be put into the world, let me reset it, too close to the shark, because if I put them in and they're like right in front of its mouth, it's too easy or you know maybe it'll be eaten right as soon as the game starts. So what I'm going to do instead is imagine that there's a circle around the shark and I want to avoid that circle of you know you're too close. So I'm going to make a method in here to help me do this and what I'd like to do is I'd like to get some random spot outside of that circle where I'll be able to safely put a fish. So in order to do that, I need a little bit of a helper class. And I'll show you how you can add your own helper class. I'm going to call this the location class. And all this location is going to be is an x and y point. And I can get rid of quite a, bun uh, quite a bit of this stuff here. I, I don't need that there. That's just part of the what's been built for me. And I suppose I can use this. So I'll go private int y, and those are my coordinates on the graphics screen. So here int x, int y, and I can initialize my values as well with it. And down here, I need a way to get them, so get x, I'll just return that x, and here I'll return that y, and then I, you know, I guess to make it a little more versatile, I can make some methods to change those values. So I don't think I'm going to need it in mind, but I might as well just uh, keep it versatile in case I use this for something else. So y is equal to y. Okay, so hopefully that's the class. There we go. It stores a location and x and y coordinates, and I can retrieve them or update them if I want to. That's all I need for this. And in my ocean class, I'm going to create a method now, which looks like this. Public, I'll get this a little higher up for you to see. So public location, get safe fish location. 
And you can tell me how far away you want to be from the shark. Now, the shark, we've got a variable here called the player, and that represents the shark that I'm trying to avoid. So down here, I'm going to get its coordinates to start. And I'll do that for the Y as well. And now what I want to do is make some random spot on the screen. And of course, there are some more graceful ways that um, we could have done this, but I'm going to just um, do this so we can illustrate how to use a loop to you. It's possible to use some, some math and, and, and make it so that we don't have to you know, always randomly be guessing where we should put the fish, but for our purposes this is going to work fine. So this will be a number from 100 to 400, so it's kind of in the middle of the X range because it's 0 to 500. Um, oh, sorry, for X it's actually 0 to 900, I believe. So let's go, um, let's just adjust this slightly here. Um, 100 to 800 instead of the 0 to 900. And then I'll make my random Y coordinate, which uh, that's what I wanted was 1 to 300 because it's uh, 0, to, 0 to 500. Sorry, 0. To, okay. Now I'll find out how far away they are. So to do that, I'm going to use the distance formula. So it's the square root of the player's x, take away this random x that I've just generated, squared plus the player's y, take away this random y, and squared as well. So this is Pythagoras' theorem, the distance formula between two points, and these are the two points that I'm calculating it on. So now that I know what it is, what I want to say is while how far is less than the distance I've been given, it's too close to the shark. So what I'm going to do instead then is I'm going to try to redo this. I'm going to repeat my code. And of course, I can't re-declare the variables. They've already been declared once, so I just have to take away that um, their data type there. And that way I'll be able to um, re-execute this code and Java will be happy with it. So let me just show you the initial condition. That's right here. That's how I initialize the state before I en enter the loop. This condition checks. I might not even need to do this, but it'll tell me here. As long as I'm greater than or equal to the distance, um, it doesn't need to do this. It only goes in the loop if I'm too close. So while I'm too close, execute this code, which gives me new random x and new random y. Then I have to recalculate, because otherwise I wouldn't be updating this condition. So in the, the loop I have here, that's the initial. This here is my um, condition that helps me uh, continue. And this here is my update of the condition. So what's safe to, as to uh, assume is that once I've left this loop, the only way I ever get out of this loop here is when I'm greater than or equal to the distance, meaning I'm now a safe distance. So I can return a new location object, and I'm going to use the x and y that I have here. So random x and random y. And I know that that location I'm giving you is far enough away from the shark to be considered safe. So there's your first example of a loop in the program. Now I'm going to go up here and do a, um, the rest of this one. And maybe just to show you that you could use both here, maybe I'll do this one as a for loop. So in here, I'll just readjust it. Remember, they're the same, they're equivalent. You could use either a for loop or a while loop. But this is a for loop that's going to take me from 0 up to the number of fish that I've got in the count and increment it by 1 every time. So the procedure is going to go like this. I'm going to have a fish. Then what I want to do is put it in the world, but I want to put it somewhere safe. So location safe equals get safe fish location. And the distance, well, I've been looking at this picture here. 
let me just minimize this. And I figure if this is the width of the shark, then if I give it about a 50% head start, it'll be something like this will be my, you know, something like that will be my circle. And I think that works well, so I'm going to go with that. Uh, let me just pull up my ocean again. So this will be um, distance equal. So the player dot get its image, and then I'll ask for its width, and then I will um, multiply it by one and a half. So that's giving again 50% more, um, one and a half times the width of the shark. You can obviously play with that number and change it around to what what uh, you feel is appropriate. But that's how far away I want my location to be, and it'll hand it to me, put it in this uh, variable called safe. So once I get that location back, what I'm going to do is say, um, let me see here. I don't have a world yet, but um, I can use the add object, which is going to be um, the fish to the safe x and safe y coordinate. So this is now got my 10 fish in there, and I can easily change that to be 20, 30, 100, even 1,000 fish if I wanted to. So you can see if I rebuild the world, compile it, all in random locations. So every time I recompile, the fish show up in different spots, and that way I know the level will be over once I've eaten all 10 fish.